I want to end this week with four small topics. These don't necessarily fit into one theme, but all four are very useful for what will follow in the next two weeks. First, let me remind you of two examples, the geometric series for Zeno's paradox and the harmonic series. The geometric series with common ratio 1 half converged to 1, but the harmonic series diverged. As I mentioned in the video about that series, this shows something really important. Both of these series have terms that get small. 1 over 2 to the n and 1 over n are both smaller and smaller numbers as n gets larger. I can say here that the limit of the terms, not of the series itself, but the limit of the terms of the series, is zero. And here's what the two examples tell me. The fact that the limit of the terms is zero doesn't mean anything about convergence. And this is one of the most common mistakes, and it's an easy one to make, since the statement is not at all intuitive. Just because the terms get small doesn't mean that the sum is finite. Adding up smaller things can still add up to infinity. Thankfully, the converse does help. If the limit of the terms is not zero, then it's impossible for the series to converge. And this is called the test for divergence, and it's the first of many techniques to study whether or not a series converges. The first thing I will do with almost any series is to look to see if the limit of the terms is zero. If it isn't, the series will diverge. I don't need to do anything else. If it is, then I don't know. What this means is that the limit of the terms being zero is necessary, but not sufficient for convergence. Remember this. Many of you will want to make this sufficient, but it isn't. It is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Just because the terms go to zero doesn't mean that the series will converge. The next thing in this video are two key examples. I've already talked about the first one, geometric series. Remember that a geometric series is one where the terms have a common ratio. It is always r to the n for some real number r. Typically, they start with n equals 0 instead of n equals 1. The common ratio can be any real number. But the geometric series converges whenever the common ratio has absolute value less than 1, and otherwise it will diverge. Moreover, I can even write the value of this series. The series will add up to exactly 1 over 1 minus r, where r is the common ratio. This is a key example, and I will return to it frequently. You can reference it, but it will be good to remember, even by repetition, the convergence condition for the geometric series. There's one more key example I want to introduce, and I'm going to call these the zeta series and use the Greek letter zeta to write them. Notation varies for these series, but they are related to a famous function in mathematics called the zeta function, and I like to take notation from that relation and call them zeta series. The zeta series for some number p, any real number again, is the sum that has terms 1 over n to the p. This is like the harmonic series. You get the harmonic series exactly for p equals 1, but it allows for other exponents in the denominator. I know the zeta series diverges for p equals 1 because I know the harmonic series diverges. Previous videos have shown that. However, for any exponent even slightly larger than 1, this converges. The convergence criteria for the zeta series is p larger than 1. Unlike the geometric series, I don't have a nice expression for the value of this series. It's not really expressible in other functions. Zeta of p is really the best way to write these outputs. The next thing in this video is some rules for a manipulating series. And these are very similar to the rules for manipulating sigma notation that I taught in Calculus 1. Here we're just applying them to infinite series instead of finite sums. First, series are linear. I can pull out constants, and a constant in this series is anything that doesn't involve the index. And I can split them up over addition and subtraction. All of the major operations in this course, limits, derivatives, integrals, are linear. Series are no exception. Next, I can change the starting index of a series by removing terms. Series are really just additions, so I can write some of the additions explicitly at the start. And if I pull out terms up to some point, then I continue with the sigma notation starting from that new starting value. I can shift a series. This is done by changing the index and the bounds. And this is all about balance. Increasing the index in the term means that you have to decrease it in the bounds to balance it out, and vice versa. So if I add 1 to the starting bound, 
I have to decrease one to the index in the term, and if I subtract one from the starting bound, then I have to increase by one in the index in the term. The infinity of the top doesn't change, of course. Regardless of where it starts, the series will still add up terms to infinity. Infinity plus one or infinity minus one doesn't make any sense here. Here is an example of a shift. I have a complicated series expression that's in two pieces, and I want to write it in one piece, but the starting values are not the same. So I want to shift it to make them the same. The first piece starts at three. So if I, if I subtract two from the bounds, that means I have to add two to the index in the term. That means replacing all of the n's in the term with n plus two. Then these two series have the same starting bound, so they can be combined by linearity. Finally, I can also bring these two to common denominator. How I do common denominator here is pretty tricky. I have a factorial on the left, but I have only the multiplication of two terms on the right. I want to get the whole factorial on the right as well. Therefore, I multiply by all of the missing terms to fill in the factorial. This is all numbers up to n minus 1 and the n plus 1, but not the n and n plus 2, because those were the ones that were already present. And the result is this numerator over the factorial of n plus 2. If you cancel everything off, you'll be left with the two original terms. Well, then the denominators are the same factorial, and the terms can be combined into one fraction. And I have finished sort of combining the sum in the nicest way. Multiply uh, manipulations, rather, with factorials are a skill that I will be focusing on more in the next couple weeks. There are a bunch of tricks to be learned for doing algebra with factorials, things like common denominator and similar operations, and they require some introduction and some practice. Finally, let me briefly talk about the decimal expansions of real numbers. You've been told that a real number is a number that can be expressed as an infinite string of digits after the decimal. Did you ever think to wonder how that infinity can make sense? Can an infinite string of digits even be defined? Does it work? Well, infinite series can now make this idea formal. What is an infinite string of digits? Well, it's actually an infinite sum of fractions. The tenth digit is whatever that digit is, d1 over 10. The hundredth digit is d2 over 100. The thousandth digit is d3 over 1000, and so on. That's what a decimal expansion means, digits over powers of 10 added up. This is an infinite series. The number is a, the whole number before the decimal, plus the digits dn, which are some numbers between 0 and 9, divided by 10 to the n, the place that they are in. Notably, the digits are all less than 10, so the terms of this sum are less than 10 over 10 to the n, which is the same as 1 over 10 to the n minus 1. And that's the terms of a geometric series with common ratio 1 over 10. Geometric series converge if the common ratio is absolute value less than 1, so this is a geometric series which converges. Therefore, all the decimal expansions of real numbers are convergent infinite series. Decimal expansions make sense. The infinite addition implicit in them will always sum to a finite number. Those series converge.